Good morning. Good morning. I am Harriet Hamasi, University Librarian at Brown, and this is my colleague, uh, Andy Van Dam, esteemed uh, professor of computer science. Um, thank you for joining us for this morning's forum on libraries and the impact of libraries and technology on teaching, learning, and research. <clears throat> I'll begin the program, <clears throat> and Andy will follow with additional comments and uh, examples from his own research and teaching. There will be time at the end of our talks for a question and answer period, so um, let us begin. <clears throat> The 21st century has been referred to as the golden age of learning, <clears throat> a time in which students will have near universal access to the highest quality teaching and scholarship. Today, anyone who can access the internet can access the research and teachings of some of the greatest scholars of our time and throughout history. From the Library of Alexandria, to the Library of Congress and beyond. Libraries have helped promote and create some of the most profound changes in access to information, with current efforts promising to bring the world the most beneficial, efficient, and equitable access to education the world has ever known. <clears throat> While acknowledging that not everyone around the globe is equally connected, we also acknowledge that a digital divide is brewing within our universities, not due to the absence of technology or even limited access to information. Rather, the digital divide we face is in how human capacities are being engaged in education and how the best traditions of scholarship and teaching are being adapted to the possibilities of our time. How will we use and be guided by innovations in technology to reimagine and reinvent teaching, learning, research, and libraries? How will we enhance current methods and practices as well as scholarly modes of inquiry and communication, even when this surely means disrupting long-held traditions that define today's academy? The essence of this talk is in relating how far libraries have come in this great leap to the future, really to the unknown. Where are we on the journey to adapt and change perceptions, processes, services, and spaces? And most importantly, how have our visions and realities, our own as well as those of our institutions, changed in order to both foster and unleash the creative passion of our students and faculty to support their full participation in 21st century modes and methods of scholarship and learning and help them shape the language and future of this era as well as their own lives? <clears throat> the traditional view of a library is a space filled with books with a goal of always buying more and more. Is that model sustainable or even appropriate in today's world? With its six on-campus locations and one off-site shelving facility, the Brown University Library provides students and faculty with access to nearly five million volumes, comprised of printed and electronic books, journals, databases, manuscripts, maps, videos, and much more. Despite its impressive holdings, there are many things the library does not own, cannot own, and perhaps does not need to own. This year, the library will spend more than $11 million on its collections. Because of the escalating prices and shrinking purchasing power, this large expenditure will only allow us to maintain our current list of journal subscriptions and acquire a decreasing number of new publications. Dealing with these local and indeed near universal challenges, the library increasingly participates in various borrowing and lending programs that greatly expand the range of resources readily available to our students and faculty. 
We also benefit from consortial purchasing arrangements with many other universities that help make our money go further. In addition, we have begun to experiment with coordinated collection development across several libraries and collaborative efforts to preserve, print, and locally digitize materials. These strategies, some of them still in their early development, will allow us to more carefully target our expenditures and build locally distinctive collections. The growing emphasis on shared global collections and open access to scholarly content are major initiatives that promise to help counter the massive distribution of information, the relentless escalation of publishing cost and fading budgets, and relieve libraries of the unrealistic expectation to own and keep everything. The library's number one priority remains to help students and faculty find, identify, select, and obtain from whatever source and in whatever form the most relevant information they need at the time they need it. Library staff provide a range of one-on-one -on -one and group research and outreach services that enable students and faculty to access and integrate all manner of scholarly resources into their own scholarship, to assess the authenticity and quality of information they have found, to compile evidence in convincing ways, to analyze it and construct arg arguments with it, whether that involves manipulating maps, charts, images, or other types of data, and to learn ethical and legal ways and frameworks for borrowing, sharing, and using information. This fall, our librarians are leading a set of customized workshops along these very topics targeted to both undergraduate and graduate students. The library also supports scholarship through its development of the Brown Digital Repository, a platform that preserves and provides long-term access to student and faculty research. Here we see an example of a joint student-faculty project under the leadership of history professor Jim Green. With help from library staff and students, with help from library staff, students digitized and indexed documents concerning U.S.-Brazil relations between 1960 and 1980. These materials have been housed in the National Archives in Washington, and even though they were publicly available because of the limited sort of physical access, almost no one had seen these materials. Today, they are part of the Brown Digital Repository and openly accessible to researchers around the world. <clears throat> As evidenced in this small set of examples, librarians often serve as mediators and promoters in the educational process, helping students apply context, connections, and continuity to their learning experiences. We help students sift through this rich and varied information landscape and establish their roles and responsibilities in our rapidly evolving society. Learning at all levels is undergoing major changes, from a focus on teaching to more attention to on learning, from passive listeners to active problem solvers, from consumers to producers, from grade-oriented to process-oriented, from low expectations for the relevancy of classes and libraries to high expectations, from established sources of authority to new sources, from textual liter literacy to multi modal literacies from classroom to online teaching and learning. These changes are reflected in colleges and libraries across the nation and echo similar transitions throughout society. Writer and futurist Marcel Bulinka recently wrote that our children will learn less yet achieve more. Competency today is less about comprehensive recall, a function that machines and search engines do well, 
and more about assembly, synthesis, perspective, critique, and interconnected systems thinking. These are the skills that help our students learn to learn. These are the skills that will help them make better decisions as they set and achieve their lifelong goals. And this generation, more than any other, will need to acquire new knowledge, new skills, and establish new goals on an almost continuous basis throughout their lives. The library is an integral part of students' academic lives and an essential part of their learning. The library provides spaces where students can collaborate on joint projects or problem solving, engage with faculty both in and out of class, consult with a librarian about a research question, find a quiet space for study or reflection, or just meet and socialize. 99% of undergraduates and over 70% of graduate students visited the Brown Libraries last year. Over the last several years, there has been a steadily increasing number of students coming into both our physical and virtual library spaces, especially as we have improved levels of comfort and functionality in many parts of these spaces. Recently renovated areas within the library, such as this space in the Rockefeller Library, provide users with the appropriate settings and tools to engage in intellectual inquiry and promote the university's broader goals of building and sustaining a shared sense of community and fostering multidisciplinary interaction. The library's new areas are designed to be flexible and support a variety of study styles, such as quiet individual study areas as well as group study rooms, and facilitate the blending of students' academic and social activities. If you have not already visited the John Hay Library and the newly renovated space in the rock shown earlier, I encourage you to do so. In the short time that we have remaining, I want to share with you a story of a particularly important reconceptualization of space that was born out of the rethinking and ultimate reshaping of library services. All of this began about five years ago in a conversation with Andy, uh, who will share his comments soon. This story features the innovative ways in which library staff are collaborating with faculty and students in developing new forms of scholarship and describes a set of skills, services, and tools in the library that enable users to view, interact with, combine, and use library and other collections in ways not previously possible. The idea to repurpose this space in the rock did not require a great vision. <laughs> this room was previously used for checking in print journals, a function that is no longer a significant part of library operations since more than 97% of our journals are come to us online. The library began by digitizing one of its largest artifacts and posting it on the web. The massive Garibaldi panorama is approximately four feet tall and 260 feet long and painted on both sides. Dating from the 1860s, this scroll depicts the life and accomplishments of Giuseppe Garibaldi, a central figure in Italy's reunification. Brown's Italian studies professor Massimo Riva is an expert on Garibaldi and frequently teaches courses on his role in Italian history. Because of its size and fragile condition, the unique and historically significant panorama had previously been all but inaccessible to Professor Riva and his students, as well as others. To gain easier manipulation of this massive artifact, 
We worked with Professor Van Dam and his students by suggesting ways to expand the native capabilities of the Microsoft Surface so that we could navigate the panorama and combine it with a range of associated historical documents layered throughout the now digital scroll. The surface proved especially useful for small groups, but completely unsatisfactory for more than three or four people at a time. What we needed was a big screen in an interactive, multifunctional lab to support the development, exploration, and creation of this and other new forms of scholarship. We were fortunate to secure a donor who helped fund this lab, and it opened just two years ago. The Patrick Ma Digital Scholarship Lab is a 1,200 square foot space, not very big, with about 30 seats, featuring a seven by 16 foot video wall, comprised of 12 55 inch high resolution LED screens with a combined resolution of over 24 megapixels. The lab is supported by robust, easy to use software as, and is open daily to individual students and faculty as well as to classes. Our overarching goal in creating the lab is to support scholarly experimentation and ambition, helping students and faculty explore and define scholarly activities and forms beyond their current capabilities, as shown here in the digital storytelling class. This flexible space facilitates group work and projects and enhances enhances collaborative problem solving. In addition to the several courses being taught in the lab, we also host bi-weekly presentations by faculty and other invited guests. Professor Sean Greenlee from Rhode Island School of Design is shown here demonstrating his research on data sonification. He is using images to both create and distort sound. And here we see the close examination of a digitized manuscript. The original is held by the John Carter Brown Library on campus. In the Digital Scholarship Lab, librarians work alongside faculty and students to enhance their ability to analyze, augment, create, visualize, and interact with data in its many forms. Building on the vision and the success of the lab, an adjoining digital studio is currently being planned. The studio will be an open, fluid space for extended, concentrated work, consultation, and production, a sort of maker space for the humanities, primarily. Libraries are a window to the future as much as they are a record of the past. They allow us to reflect on ourselves as well as the world around us. They also allow us to gain access to and produce and process knowledge, and they in provide an inestimable academic and personal opportunity for students and faculty, both today and tomorrow. Professor Van Dam will now set up his um, machine and uh, share with us many examples. Do you want to take a few questions while we're setting sure, up? Sure, sure. Yeah, Glad to. Yes. Are there any questions? Yes. I have a quick one um, concerning the wonderful Center for the History of Slavery and Research that we saw last night. It occurred to me, yet again, here's a new, not new in terms of the history, but a new opportunity to expand resources. And of course, it also puts demands on the library budget. You may not have as many materials on the history of slavery and justice, et cetera. What happens when there's a new project like that, and how does the library work with faculty and students? We are often called on to um, sometimes ex ex um, make greater use of the resources that we have, and I think the history of um, this, this new center is a perfect example. Uh, there's a set of archives in the library uh, about a slave uh, who lived, uh, a former slave, who lived in Providence 
and I'm told actually lived in a tree uh, and you know kind of out in the wild. Um, and this uh, set of archives is very little known, and um, we would uh, Tony Bogues suggests that we digitize this and that students write research around it. Occasionally, of course, there are people who offer uh, to give um, materials that are related to, to um, you know, this new form of study. And occasionally, uh, you know, we do go to the provost together and say, this is what we need to purchase and um, to help sustain uh, a new uh, program such as, such as Slavery and Justice. I don't think Andy's quite ready, so if there's another question, I'm happy to take it. Yes. I may have missed it, but where is the digital library? Where is this located? It's in the Rockefeller Library. All right. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's really uh, a pleasure to be working again with Harriet. She's been the inspiration and the instigator of the work I'm going to be talking to you about. And while my team lead, Jessica Fu, an undergraduate, as are all the people working on the project, they're all undergraduates under her leadership, uh, this is a foray into what is often called the digital humanities these days. And even though I'm in computer science, I have had a very long history of working with humanities scholars and trying to be a good toolsmith, giving them tools that will help accelerate the progress of their work. And their teaching is certainly part of what I think of as their work. Um, I started in 1967 working with Ted Nelson, who coined the term hypertext. And you probably all know what hyperlinks are, since I'm sure you're all web users. That idea came from him and we built together with undergraduates what is probably the world's first hypertext system and it was almost immediately put to use by humanities scholars uh, to create syllabi and other materials. And the important thing about it was that the thing we created, even though it was one of a kind, was interactive. And that's really been my professional careers quest to figure out how we can put humans in the loop and give them interactive tools for doing their scholarship, their teaching, and their research. So the system that I'm going to demonstrate is called Touch Art Gallery, and it represents a very small slice of the kinds of tools that <coughs> we've been working on for four plus decades at this point. If at any time you want to interrupt and ask a question, I'm really happy to uh, explain what, what you see. Sometimes it goes by a little quickly. Let me tell you a little bit about what the idea was and how Harriet got me into this. She has this amazing artifact, which actually Massimo Riva's class, which is studying the panorama, is going to see on Tuesday, and Jess and some of her teammates and I are going to go see it as well. Going to means we have to travel in a car four miles to where it's stored in an air-conditioned vault because it is that fragile. And it can't even be unrolled very often because every time it's unrolled, it does a little bit of damage to the scroll. So here we have this fantastic artifact, and it's a tribute to Helen's vision that she figured out very early on. The only way that we're going to get any use out of this artifact is to make it available digitally. Well, there is a web presence, and it's a very good one. It's a nice video, and you can do pretty well on just an ordinary browser on an ordinary uh, laptop, let's say. But when Harriet found out, because she's an active leader of tech journals and things like that, that there was this new gadget coming out called the Microsoft Surface, which is a coffee table about this big. You saw several pictures of it in your slides. She called me up and she said, you know, it would be really interesting if you could figure out a way of making all this digitized imagery 
available to people so that they could actually not just see it, but touch it in some sense. It's a touch table. Think of your smartphone on steroids. And by the way, uh, we now have 255-inch displays this big that are touch displays. And I've seen it run on an 82-inch display, and it's fantastic how much better a large piece of art looks on a large screen than it does on a small screen. But anyhow, back then we didn't have those. We just had the possibility of getting this coffee table size display. So to cut to the chase, she threw some money at the problem, and I threw some money at the problem. We bought two tables, and we started working on a piece of software that let us interactively explore this piece of artwork that is the size of two football fields. Think about that. It's not something that you would treat in kind of ordinary way, but just looking at an image of it on the screen, you'd be able to move around. You need to pan and zoom, as it's called in the trade. So we built this piece of software. It was called the Garibaldi Panorama Software, and it was so successful it was used in Massimo's course and we started thinking, boy, this is really a good idea. Why don't we generalize it? If it works so well for the Garibaldi banner and the, the lots of other pieces of large art, fragile art, stuff that you can't really touch. So we're now working on generation number four of the Justice Leadership. It is available in the Microsoft Store. You can download it for free. It's a free app. and. Uh, we are, again, using it in multiple courses and for research. So what I'm going to do, and will give you a little bit of an overview of the genesis of this project, is show it to you, because that's really the best way for you to see it. And I would encourage you afterwards to come and play with it. Unfortunately, we don't have one of those lovely 55-inch displays here. I'm going to be driving it from a smaller version of the Microsoft Surface, which is this tablet. It's just like an iPad, except from a different manufacturer, Microsoft in this case. And uh, first, I'm going to show you what the user experience feels like. Uh, by the way, it's been used in two courses at this point. Sheila Bond's art history course, which has multiple hundred people in it, and Massimo's course on panoramas. And I say panoramas plural because he actually is with Peter Harrington, who works with uh, Harriet, talking about three different panoramas, one which is even larger than our Garibaldi panorama. So uh, it's been used in two courses, and it runs in the Seattle Art Museum, where there's currently an exhibition on pop art. And in one of the galleries, they have one of these 55-inch displays, as well as some of these tablets. And uh, it's being used, quote, in production there. And we're in negotiation with the Whaling Museum in New Bedford. Um, they're going to install one of our systems as well, and I'll tell you about their panorama in a moment. Uh, let me just show you what this looks like. We have a timeline here at the top, as you can see, and I can push on any one of these buttons and see what was done at that particular time. And I can also just look at these miniatures and scroll through them and find something interesting to look at. So let me start by one of my favorite pieces of art, the Night Watch. I'm Dutch. And I had the pleasure of going back to the Netherlands in May and actually seeing this newly restored artwork in a newly restored wing of the Rijksmuseum, which is a beautiful building. If you happen to be in Amsterdam, go see it. And I had a very interesting experience. We had the digitized version of this artwork and we had made a tour of it. And I was able, on a day when there weren't very many visitors in the museum, to essentially get as close as I am to Harry. practically stick my face into the painting. And I saw stuff that I hadn't seen on this digital version. But interestingly enough, uh, I also was able to 
see things in the digital version that I wasn't able to in the painting because no matter how close you get to it physically, you can't get as close as you can when you can literally zoom in on how beautifully, precisely Rembrandt painted this eye and the reflections in the eye. There are also lots of other details in the painting that I couldn't appreciate even by looking at it with good lighting, by the way. So the point that I'm trying to make is you shouldn't think of the digital version as an impoverished version of the real thing. It has a physicality of its own, the experience of actually being able to pinch zoom your way in and practically touch the fabric, the paint, works wonderfully for textiles, by the way, uh, is an extra dimension. And the best of both worlds is what you really want, where you have this indefinitely zoomable kind of image. And then you also have the real thing in front of you. Well, here's a real thing that you can't actually look at. This is the world's largest folk art artifact. It is the AIDS Memorial quilt. It is 22 acres of hand-sewn panels, 22 acres. They started off in the 70s and they were able to display panels on the Washington Memorial Mall. And that worked until about the late 1990s and then there were too many panels for the quilt to be shown. <coughs> so on multiple occasions, uh, they unrolled parts of it. And just to move it and to put it together, even in pieces, requires an army of volunteers. There's really no good way to see it today, except like this. There is 22 acres, and as you notice, I can come in just using my fingers in a way that you will know from using your smartphones, and I can look at essentially an arbitrary amount of detail. And being able to touch this is a very meaningful experience for people like me who have lost family members and friends to this horrible disease. So I think this is really a tribute to what good digital technology can do for giving people rich experiences that they really can't have in any other way. So let me now show you the, the Garibaldi panorama that we've talked about. And let's see. I'll find it over here. And there's a little bit of information here. And you notice I can make these little information panels go away. This little strip of paper is two football fields, folks. <laughs> And what I'm going to do, by the way, this is all coming in in real time, being streamed from a server. It's coming in over the internet, as you can see. As long as I don't do it too quickly, I can take a look at this panorama and come in as close as I want to so I can see just how impressionistic these faces are because this is the thing about panoramas. They were the Ken Burns documentary of the mid-1800s. There were these ginormous wooden rollers, and they were trucked from village to village, town to town. And then there were paid performances where early guys would unroll it one frame at a time. And the narrator would talk about what was to be seen in each individual frame. One of the marvelous things about the Garibaldi panorama is that we actually have the narrator's script. So we're able to know exactly how they portray the panorama and what the storytelling about it was. So uh, let me show you one of the unique features of our system, which is not just that you can look at an artwork of arbitrary size and come in as close as you like, but that we can create 
Ken Burns style narratives using those same visual vocabulary elements of slow pans and zooms and the popping up of additional information. Please. Just as an aside, I'm curious, the Garibaldi panorama, what is the medium? The medium is a kind of wallpaper, very fragile. And what is, and the paint is what, like a, a, a uh, is it water oil paint it's or water? Water Watercolors. Watercolors. Yeah. Okay. And it's amazingly vivid. I've seen it once, and you might think after looking at it, those reds are possibly a little overdone. They're not. It is that vivid and that bright. So I'm going to see it for the second time, and Jess and her teammates are going to see it for the first time. Any other questions before I show you I'll this narrated tour? About the panorama. Um, I actually didn't know that Andy and Massimo are going to see it. I, I probably would have nixed that. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hear it from me. <laughs> uh, we, we had the uh, panorama repaired, and it was a very expensive uh, repair job uh, to restore because there were tears in it and so on. Uh, so it has been put back together, and the decision, I thought, was that it would not be opened again. But I guess for these two, it's <laughs> <laughs> How did Brown get it, and when did Brown get it? It was given to Brown uh, around the year of 2000. Uh, there was a fellow who, uh, he was not the original owner, uh, but um, he, he was enamored of panoramas and also, I guess, of Italian history as well. And um, we have an excellent military collection here, and so it was given to kind of complement the military collection. And it sat um, in a corner uh, in the stacks, and when I came to Brown in 2005, I saw it in the corner and I said, what's this? You know, and I just couldn't continue to sit there, so that was... <laughs> Well, that makes our viewing occasion on Tuesday even rarer. <laughs> I'm glad we had this little chat. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> All right, then. So uh, I'm going to show you the Ken Burns style documentary that was built by one of the master students. You'll hear his narrator's voice. He's a little over the top melodramatic, but he uh, works on, worked on our local radio station and he provided some of the machinery as a computer science student for exhibiting tours. So I'm just going to click on this tour and let it run. And then I'll show you a unique feature <laughs> once it's running. So again, this is coming off the internet. And it should be here any moment. I mean, that raises an interesting question, though. Yeah. In a way, I find it a little disturbing. That, but I fully understand it when you say we're never going to open it again. I guess it's I have to ask the question, what's the light like keeping it? If you can never look at it again. I know you can see it this way, but I mean, isn't there something lost by it never being opened again? Right, and I mean, I was, of course, exa exaggerating, though yeah. I will say that it's it's a very difficult thing physically to manage, so we do need to be very careful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was being dragged around campus here and there, you know, yes. bring it to our department. <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell you in a moment about what we're doing with New Bedford, because that addresses this problem in some way. So I'm going to do about a minute and a half of this tour, and then I'll, in the Times of Garibaldi, show you is an example of the use of a popular it. subject for commercial entertainment. In 1860, the year in which the panorama was produced, Giuseppe Garibaldi was the man of the moment. His portraits, as well as his achievements at unifying Italy, graced the pages of the illustrated newspapers. Wars were particularly appealing subjects for panorama painters, and the events in Italy offered more than their fair share of combat, action, and drama. In this scene from the panorama, at the Battle of Milazzo, a major battle in the war for the liberation of eastern Sicily, the battalion of English volunteers commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Dunn, fighting alongside Garibaldi and his men, has gained an advanced post. 
They create a barricade at the top of the narrow strip of land between the mainland and the citadel and maintain fire against the Neapolitans. The manuscript for the panorama also mentions other names of volunteers in the English battalion. Major Percy Wyndham, cousin of General Wyndham, greatly distinguished himself at Malazzo, especially in storming at the head of a few of his regiments a walled vineyard filled with Neapolitan riflemen. Peter Cunningham, a young sailor, asked Colonel Wyndham to pitch him over the vineyard wall behind which were the Neapolitan riflemen. The wall was seven feet high and he fell among the enemy like a bombshell and with nearly the same effect for they ran off right and left, startled at his sudden appearance. It appears that the panorama's creator, J.J. Story, used a major newspaper, the Illustrated London News, as a direct source for paint. Okay, now, here's what's unique about this. I look at this and I say, huh, I'd like to blow that up. So in the middle of the tour, I stop it and I can use exactly the same machinery that you saw me using on the original artwork and this text is totally readable. And then when I'm done with my interactive examination... This scene. Not only is the general composition of the smoke-filled tower framed by town buildings clearly taken from the article lithograph, but individual figures themselves have been copied. We can see this in the foreground figure sitting with his head in his hands to the right of three bodies, something which is in both images. There are also... So, visual effects... Panning, zooming, isolated, interesting parts of a piece of art. We can draw over it. Can't hurt the artwork. It's all done digitally. It's just an overlay plane. Uh, we can type some text to annotate it. So we can enrich the material that we're looking at with secondary material, assets, associated media, and so on and so forth. So, if I wanted to know what is that building, or what is that mountain, uh, and maybe some uh, other parts of that, what's happening here? Uh, can you have access to that, or those links as well, or are you working on that? Okay, so that's an excellent question. Um, it's a matter of how much time, <laughs> energy, and money you have to invest in content. I just wanted to shut something in the future. So, it could be a student project, for example. Oh, it's way more than a student project. <laughs> <laughs> we know that we can give you a version of that now already. And in fact, for Massimo Riva's course on panoramas this semester, all of the students, instead of doing traditional term papers, are going to be creating interactive tours using the module in the system that I'm about to demonstrate to you. So they will be creating that kind of content where you can look at something and get more information. The so-called hot spots, and you can tap on the hot spot and you get a little bit of a narration or a video or something else that explains what's going on there. So uh, to do the totally general version of that is a major project, but we have pretty simple and easy to understand mechanisms for giving you most of what you suggested. One piece at a time. Right? One piece at a time, yeah. and the students are each of them going to do some of that for their journey projects. Okay. Apologize for being fixated on this extraordinary project, but did a group of artists paint this uh, one person? So what do we know about how it was produced? What I know, and Harriet can tell her version of it. Uh, what we know is that there was a studio mm -hmm. in Nottingham in the 1860s and that James Storer was the person in charge, but uh, given how much there is, we suspect that he did it the way that many paintings were done mm -hmm. in the Renaissance before and after the war. You had a studio and you had the master, and then you had lots of apprentices right. filling in the details. And you notice here the details are very sketchy, literally, as well as figuratively. It's very impressionistic, and that's because you could get away with it because it's meant to be viewed at a distance. What we're doing, which is zooming in on individual brush strokes, wasn't possible with the original. Nobody got that close. So you can take great liberties. 
uh, the whaling panorama. So before I even finish my talk here by uh, showing you our authoring module, let me tell you about the whaling museum's panorama. It is a quarter of a mile long by nine feet high. It is on linen, again using watercolors, and it's in the process of being restored. But it started a fundraising campaign by the unveiling of this program just last week, months ago, and I went to be there for this grand opening. And over the course of multiple years, it will be restored. But it's going to be restored, not offline, the way uh, Harry's panel was. It's going to be restored in situ. And for purposes both of showing it and for restoring it, they found this wild and crazy guy who got an engineering physics degree from Penn, but his real love is blacksmithing. And he has built an infernal device, <laughs> which is a table that goes from here to here with hand-cranked machinery. He doesn't use anything electrical. He wants it to be as true to what might have been available in those days. And it's a tilt table so that you can take it for restoration purposes to the horizontal position and then tilt it to the vertical position for viewing. That panorama will take probably multiple years to be restored in pieces. And it is said that it was done too in the space of about a year, which must have had a ton of people working on it because it has so many scenes and the detail is so fun. It shows whaling far voyages around the world and it has, it's a travelogue as well as scenes of the whaling activity itself. And there's no way one person could have done that in one year. So long-winded answer to the question, we suspect that was a gang of people under the leadership of the masters. I mean, I, I think I'm not stretching the point to say that the, the raw panoramas were, you might say, the first form of movies in essence. That's why I said early converts. Absolutely right. right. And they were in stark contrast to the fixed panoramas or dioramas where they constructed very large buildings where you could stand in the center mm -hmm. and look all around you 360 degrees. The advantage being that you were sort of immersed in the uh, in the scene, but there's only so much building you can build, and there's only so much scenery you can have. Whereas if you have 120 feet available, you can show an awful lot more. Just curious, the uh, Garibaldi panel is two sided. It's kind of yes. Sides. The one is just a single well, side. Single side lens. Where, where was this art? Panoramas were done all over the continent and even some in this country. That's what Massimo's course is about, the history of these moving panoramas. Let me, before too many of you leave, show you how we make this kind of Ken Burns style narrative. I'll show you just a few features of it. And what I want to tell you is that we basically uh, I can close this, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to relaunch the application, and this time I'm going to go into authoring mode. So we want... Okay, let me try that again. Add min. The previous mode is meant for walk-up viewers who know how to use their smartphone. This mode is meant to be used by curators, content creators, none of whom have to be IT specialists. This is what we call a what you see is what you get user interface. No programming, no scripting. And I'm going to show you just how easy that metaphor is for creating a, a very simple kind of tour. So here I have the beginning of, now well, I got the wrong tour. Let me go back here. I want Andy's tour. 
There it is. I just made that this morning. Here's the metaphor. It's a movie maker metaphor. What we have are a number of tracks that run in parallel. And where you see a green bar, that's when a particular track is active. So I have this time head over here. And I can move that time head by hand as I'm creating. But I can also let it run. So I'll show you what I have so far. A slow zoom in on the panorama. And... I'll show you what those circles are about in just a moment. When the green bar stops, that asset goes away and the next asset pops up. I'm now inside that green bar and in just a few more seconds, having done pans and zooms, and I'll show you how I did those, we're going to enter another asset coming up. And boy, this is taking a long time, isn't it? Well, maybe I'm a little impatient. And what I'll do is I'll uh, move this guy up so he yeah. comes a little earlier. Let's have him a little earlier in the scene. And it's a picture of Garibaldi himself. So what I've just shown you is I can put these tracks anywhere I like on the timeline. So what are these circles? They are keyframes where something interesting happens. So what I can do is say, I want to move to a different place right there. And I do it just by direct manipulation. I scroll to where I want to be. Let's look at this scene from there and zoom in on this person. And now I have a new keyframe there. And what happens is that we will smoothly interpolate between the previous keyframe and this keyframe. So soon he disappears and we keep slow pan to the next frame, which will be what I asked for. So I can slide these as well just with my fingers. Notice I've done no typing. And in the interest of saving time, I won't show you how easy it is to mask out a region. You know, I have features for that annotate. I can write, I can draw. Here's how, how quickly I can do. Let's say I want to zoom in on him. I can drag that out. I can set the opacity. I want it to be about there. And now I want to add it to the panorama. So I'll select it and I'll attach it there. And I get that kind of highlighting effect. No typing, all direct manipulation. That's the interface. So our claim is that people can learn to do this kind of content creation where they can do Ken Burns Plus. You can't stop the campus video. That's it. Let me zoom in on that detail. It doesn't work. It's a video. This is not. This is live. Yes. Do you demonstrate this yourself within Massimo's course, or do some of the students? Uh, Massimo demonstrates how to use it. Uh, Jess and her colleague Dan. Uh, are running laboratory sessions for the students to make sure they're comfortable. But our design goal is that it shouldn't take more than a couple of hours to learn everything there is to know about authoring for people who are not digerati. How long have we been working on this? Well, this is version number four. And when did you first call? Four years ago? Yeah, so, and it's a, it's a good sized project. Jess has eight people on her team. They were here full time during the summer and they're working part time now. Any other questions for either of us? You can't even ask her possibly the role of the question of the kids in the law pocket, but it's about you. you. You're a famous name to me as a Brown man graduated many years ago. Your, your name surfaced. A good while ago, you were the, it seems to me you were the entire internet uh, uh, faculty. Uh, for, for some I was the ago. first computer scientist to come to Brown in yeah. 65. That much is true. The rest <laughs> is a lie. <laughs> 
a little exaggerated, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> I was the first chair, right, so I was the founding chair of the department, which started off with seven people, we have 28 now, so we're the largest science department on campus, the uh, division of biomed is larger, but we're the largest single science department, engineering is slightly larger, they too are a larger unit, they're a school. So the technically, uh, this is sort of technical. So what is the amount of uh, information space in terms of you know memory that is accessible here? And if I catch what you've done here, right, is you can pan and zoom or smoothly move from anywhere in that space to anywhere else. Yep. Interact. So uh, we have about 50 gigapixels in the Garibaldi panorama because fortunately Harriet had the foresight to have it scanned at high resolution. That was a Most hard work is not available to us at that high resolution and it's expensive. So what as you saw, it's a studio with special lights, special cameras. But you know, even with good cell phones these days, you can now do, take high res images. Yeah. Five years ago, you couldn't. So this is all getting commoditized and it's not a big deal. And because we don't really store things locally, it's in the cloud and it can be arbitrarily large. So you're dynamically Dynamically bringing it in, that's exactly right. Now, so this is viable across the internet? Absolutely. You need internet connectivity, but once you're on the internet, you can be anywhere, and you can look at arbitrary sized imagery, because it's streaming in, and the technique that we used was done at Microsoft. It's called image tiling. So you basically divide the entire screen, sorry, not the screen, the artwork, whatever it is you want to look at, into tiles of pretty ordinary size, and then you combine adjacent tiles into a tile that loses some precision, it loses pixels, but it's a decent representation, and then you keep doing that. So at the very top, you have a pretty crude representation, but as soon as you look at a piece crudely represented, immediately the software grabs the underlying tiles that are at higher resolution. So, so is that Microsoft that technology is Microsoft that you're technology. building upon? Yes, indeed. Wow. You just have to sign up for the free Microsoft app in order yeah. to Yeah, and you don't even know that that's under the hood and you don't care. And would the idea be that in time and that literally every museum would eventually begin to, to cover their collection in this map? I would hope so. <laughs> Will it be our software that does that? I can't guarantee that at all. So far we've got two museums signed up. But now we'll see how it goes. So I just had there's a huge amount of work that has been going on for many years on digitizing museum collections paintings and such. There's actually been a conference for many years, archive, uh, museums and the web, uh, starting with one individual who set up a company called Archives and Museum Informatics in Pittsburgh back in 1986. My ex-husband, David Bearman, Brown graduate, 1970. Uh, so a lot has been going on using different kinds of software. Uh, of course, the work that you're doing on panoramas is a lot more complicated, but certainly this, the uh, Many museums around the world are now involved, so you might want to look up museums on the web. Yeah, we uh, we absolutely proselytize and evangelize at uh, annual uh, uh, conferences of museum directors and so on. So uh, this will be part of what we do. But uh, what I wanted to show you is an important point, which is we don't just look at artwork. We also look at precious holdings in libraries. And we have really some amazing manuscripts. So I always say museum and libraries 
because, for example, one of Harriet's libraries has a phenomenal map collection, and those maps are precious, and many of them can't be seen because they're too... Uh, too difficult to exhibit properly. So here we have one of these lovely illustrated manuscript. By the way, I, I don't know whether you noticed it, but it was a little fuzzy in the beginning and then it cleaned right up. That's because we got the low resolution tile first and then the low resolution tile dissolved into high resolution stuff and you can see you can come in on this just the way you do on a painting. So museum and library and their precious artifacts. That's the domain of discourse. I've monopolized this conversation and that's not part of the program. Please direct some questions <laughs> at the boss here. Uh, I must complete uh, here. How many uh, different uh, boundaries did you go through in terms of the resolution as you panned in? Uh, my guess is that you never go through more than 10 layers of time. It's not 10,000 or anything like that. And, but that's all part of this. You didn't it's all that. part of what is called deep zoom Real. technology, that's which <laughs> Microsoft put out in the public domain. Anybody can use it. It's fascinating. Yeah, it's a very nice technique. It comes out of computer vision. Yeah. Uh, the way you're describing the timeline reminds me of uh, the way things happen in the geospatial area when you're using maps and stuff for those technologies. Yeah. I'm also interested, as you uh, work on this, one of the challenges got to be the technology changes so much, developing standards that people stick with for the amount of time that it takes to actually scan these drawings and get out into the public has got to be a challenge. Is there a group working on a standard that I would say uh, goes through the, uh, the, uh, the timeline so that you can actually do this in a period of time where this software is not obsolete in another five years. How do you get through all the artwork and get everybody to cooperate in, a, in a, an amount of time where you can actually do this to a significant amount of museum holdings around the world? Yeah, that's a very serious problem. Uh, Harriet has a group of really very knowledgeable high-tech humanities plus digital technology people working for it. And they are certainly working on standards with their colleagues all over the country and the world. And I've been insulated from that. We use lowest common denominator standards, JPEGs, things like that, uh, and try not to rely on a moving, platform underneath us, but it, it does mean that digital rot in the digital humanities is a constant issue. Harry, do you want to say anything about standardization? Well, it is a, a struggle, not just for libraries, but I think across the digital realm of uh, how do we maintain, how it, nobody really knows what digital preservation is. Uh, I mean, we, we don't have a, a real answer, so this is a problem that everybody's facing. Uh, what, to what extent are the major companies, and I would say there's two or three of them out there, uh, ready to, you know, really dig in and create things like this? Or to what extent are you doing what you would still call research that they aren't picking up? Okay, um, this work, and I should have mentioned it, I was delinquent has been sponsored from the beginning by Microsoft at a pretty low level. Uh, just enough to employ slave labor, I mean student labor. <laughs> <laughs> very cheap, very hard work. Uh, Google has implemented Google Art, and that was a hobby project by some Google engineers. But they're not in this space, and Microsoft isn't in this space. They had a small effort in the digital humanities, digital scholarship, and as far as I know, it will not be sustained mm. under the new regime. And the, as you know, they've laid people off, and they're budget cutting, 
So it's not a good environment to get corporate sponsorship, and it's not their core business, so they're not going to invest in it. But isn't this, I mean, in some sense, this is uh, multimedia, future learning books? Uh, yes, yes, it is. yes, and cultural and heritage. It's everything. Yes. It is everything. <laughs> you don't have to convince us. <laughs> But that's not the same as enterprise I understand that. and data processing. That, yes. Actually, my question was about uh, the Google Archive. They know they're digitizing a very high quality across the world. And can you sort of integrate those, in those files into this project? We Does have, it matter that this isn't Microsoft? No. Nah, it's not Microsoft. It's Brown and it's public domain. We give it away for free. So, um, I, I think you make a good point that we should be more proactive about seeing whether we can get a hold of some of their imagery. Part of the problem, by the way, is copyright and intellectual property. For example, uh, all the major museums have, in fact, very high quality imagery. They won't release it. So we've asked, we've begged, we've pleaded. And at best, we sometimes get medium resolution stuff. But what I found, and this is actually an interesting observation, uh, you know, I, I can show you some of these Rembrandts, and they're low res, and even though they're low res, they actually can give you a pretty decent viewing experience. By the way, this combination of my touch tablet and the projector don't give you as high res a experience as you can get if I were to disconnect where the resolution would improve pretty dramatically. But, you know, for looking at this image, you can zoom in and you can still see a fair amount of detail. You don't have to have the ultimate in high res. The eight mode is low res, and even so, it serves the purpose. You can read it, you can see how individual panels have been constructed. Uh, with textiles, we did a RISD exhibition for their textile department where you could really zoom in and look at the techniques that the weavers use to construct those artworks. And that was not high res either. So I'm, I'm going to have to follow up on your suggestion. I've been lazy. Uh, this, this is just a comment. Um, we, we, of course, see the application of all this technology uh, as, as being at most useful for museums, libraries, and so on for scholarly purposes. But I just wanted to point out that these same kinds of concepts are very much a hot topic in commerce right now as well. Um, there are a lot of companies, and sometimes very small companies, all over the world that are finding ways to put links into video and, and internet content, sometimes even television programming, so that the viewer can link on this and perhaps send in a comment or find out where they can buy whatever that object is, because the advertising industry is very, very worried that they're going to be left behind by these technological advances. So they are very much behind trying to find ways to stick advertising into images. So this is the same, a similar kind of technology. Obviously, we see that this is a much more important application in many respects because it allows people to understand more about what they're looking at. But this is something that all the students in all areas of, of, of work are going to have to know more and more about as time goes on. It is the world of the future, and our students are definitely immersed in that world on a daily basis. Just to tie it back to Harry and stop, she's giving me the. I <laughs> <laughs> she has a comment. I wanted to make a comment. Uh, this is what her labs are about: <coughs> allowing students and faculty to create new materials, to experiment with new forms of creative and intellectual expression, and to provide a state-of-the-art home for that sort of exploration. And by the way, I can't overemphasize how different it is to create something and view something on your little laptop versus seeing it on the screen that, as she says, has 24 million pixels and can really show you large-scale images with huge amount of fine-grained detail. 
the, the real estate matters, size matters. Sorry. So I just wanted to wrap up and say that I hope that um, this um, expression has, has shown you the ways in which libraries are still important um, holders and uh, distributors of content. But I think maybe more importantly, uh, especially today, is how we're able to interact with content. And the great partnership that the library has experienced with Andy and his students, I think it is a terrific uh, example of what Brown can offer, of showing what's possible. Uh, is it absolute? <clears throat> Will this be uh, continue forever? No, this is an exploration, a research effort. Um, it exposes students to such great things, not only as far as their uh, technical skills, but also their kind of intellectual uh, curiosity and ambition. So I think it's been a terrific uh, partnership, and I just want to express my appreciation to Andy in particular. Well, and vice versa. It wouldn't have happened without you. By the way, uh, I think we're done with the official program. I encourage you all to come and play. Uh, you want to see the Garibaldi panorama, the eight squilled of the night watch. What do you want to interact with? Garibaldi. 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 Coming right up. There it is. Enjoy. Enjoy.